um, has to do with the Occupy Wall Street protests. Uh, the Occupy Wall Street protests in New York that have just entered their fourth week. These protests have gained enough national traction that individual Republican candidates for president are now being asked about the protests as they campaign across the country. Here, for instance, is Republican presidential frontrunner Mitt Romney denouncing the Occupy Wall Street protests earlier today at a campaign stop in New Hampshire. I think the idea of dividing our nation at a time of crisis is the wrong way to go. All the streets are connected. Wall Street's connected to Main Street. And, and so finding a scapegoat, finding someone to blame, in my opinion, isn't the right way to go. All the streets are connected, Wall Street connected to Main Street. You know, that is actually a checkable thing. And if you check it, it turns out not to be true. Here is a map of Manhattan. Uh, there's Wall Street at the very bottom of Manhattan over there on the left. Uh, and there is a Main Street in New York City. It is all the way over there, uh, sort of in the center right there. Turns out they are not at all connected. In fact, they are separated by a body of water. Main Street in New York City is located on Roosevelt Island, which is a lovely but tiny island in the East River. So if you want to go from Main Street to Wall Street in New York City, they are not connected. You gotta use the gondola. Okay, I mean, technically the tramway, I guess they call it, which connects Roosevelt Island to Manhattan and thus that connects Main Street to Wall Street. Sorry, Mitt Romney, work on the metaphor. They are not connected, except by a vaguely Swiss-seeming thing that you probably don't want to talk about. The Republican presidential frontrunner having to come up with an attempted snappy rejoinder to your protest, failing, but attempting to come up with that rejoinder, that is actually, for the protesters, a pretty sure sign that their protest movement is catching on. Another sign, accelerated media coverage of the cause. Not media coverage of the organization necessarily or specific protesters, but of the cause that the protest is against. For example, in the month before the Occupy Wall Street movement, there were, to our count, 164 mentions of the phrase corporate greed in the news. In one month, 164 mentions. In the month since the Occupy Wall Street movement has been underway, 1,801 mentions of that same phrase, corporate greed, in the news. Here's another sign that your movement may be gaining some momentum. Your protest, which is narrowly focused at first to one specific geographic location, in this case, Wall Street, your protest begins to spread fast, well beyond that initial location. Today, NBC News got video in of Occupy Wall Street spin-off protests being held in Boston, in Atlanta, in Washington, D.C., in Columbus, Ohio, in Des Moines, Iowa, all today, and that's just what we got tape of. Over the weekend, we got video in of Occupy protests being held in Portland, Oregon, and in Knoxville, Tennessee, and in Chicago, and in Indianapolis, and in Cincinnati, and in Philadelphia, and in Sacramento, and in San Francisco. Today, New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg announced that the protesters who have camped out on actual Wall Street in New York City will be allowed to stay there indefinitely. Officials in Washington, D.C., giving protesters there permission to stay for at least four more months. But perhaps the best sign that your protest movement is catching on would be this one right here. Uh, dead-end saboteurs showing up from the right to try to take the whole thing out of context and make it look like something that it's not. Tape here of right-wing activist James O'Keefe. Remember him from the acorn fake pimp thing, the Shirley Sherrod thing? Uh, wandering around Occupy Wall Street today, presumably in some attempt to make the protest look like it has something to do with hookers or that it implies something scary about black people. Yeah, not sure what the scary black people or scary hookers storyline will be yet. We'll have to wait for the grossly, malignly edited tape. A conservative writer with the American Spectator magazine acknowledging today, too, that he infiltrated the Occupy DC protests, provoking a pepper spray confrontation with a security guard at a national museum, specifically provoking the pepper spray incident as a provocateur. Occupy Wall Street has officially engendered a full-scale right-wing freakout from the people on the right who have made themselves responsible for defending the specific policies that are now being protested against. People who have been advancing and defending policies that advance the interests of the richest 1% of people in the country. Those folks are now in full panic mode. I, for one, am increasingly concerned about the growing mobs occupying Wall Street and the other cities across the country. Sowing class envy and social unrest is not what we do in America. You think that's what the president is doing? I think the president doing. is doing that. I think he's preying on the emotions of fear, envy, and anger, and that is not constructive to unifying America. My parents, they never played the victim card. 
My parents never said that we hope that the rich people lose something so we can get something. I don't have a lot of patience for people who want to protest the success of somebody else. Capitalists, if you think that you can play footsies with these people, you're wrong. They will come for you and drag you into the streets and kill you. They will do it. They're not messing around. Those in the media, and I say this, I am included in this. They will drag us out into the streets and kill us. If you're wealthy, they will kill you for what you have. You know, Glenn Beck still exists. Uh, that was apparently him on his radio show today. They're coming to kill you! After the... Never mind, I'm not even... I'm not going to get into the mind of Glenn Beck. Never mind. The right is going to try to make this movement seem super scary, right? They don't even need Glenn Beck, but Glenn Beck helps. And people can be scared by protest in general, absolutely. You can use that to scare people, particularly if police continue to use brutal tactics against the protesters. That itself can make the protesters seem scary. Counterintuitively, if police are beating people up and using pepper spray on people, it can make those people who the police are abusing seem like scary people. We have seen this before in the past. But the idea here, the message that the protests are promoting, is not only a simple one to say, it is a simple one to understand. Case in point, Friday night's Bill Maher show on HBO experienced what was apparently, at least anecdotally reported to be, the first ever standing ovation given to a comment by a guest on that show. On stage with Bill Maher was former Democratic Congressman Alan Grayson of Florida, former George W. Bush Communications Director Nicole Wallace, who you've seen on this show, and over on the right, a conservative writer and satirist named P.J. O'Rourke. After Congressman Grayson gave a rather eloquent description of the problems raised by Occupy Wall Street, the critique they have been raising, things like Wall Street's financial grip over both political parties and what hasn't happened since the financial crisis caused by Wall Street in 2008, P.J. O'Rourke tried not so much to denounce the movement as a whole, but rather to just mock it. And Congressman Grayson, mercilessly, it was a move that did not end well uh, for P.J. O'Rourke and ended very well for Congressman Ellen Grayson. Get the man! Drum. They found their spokesman. Okay. Well, <laughs> if I choose off, get listen. a bongo drum, forget where to go to the bathroom, and it's yours. Listen, if I am a spokesman for all the people who think that we should not have 24 million people in this country who can't find a full time job, that we should not have 50 million people in this country who can't see a doctor when they're sick, that we shouldn't have 47 million people in this country who need government help in order to feed themselves, and we shouldn't have 15 million families who owe more on their mortgage than the value of their home. Okay. I'll be that spokesman. <laughs> oh, look, they're standing in the audience. Okay. Oh, look, they're standing in the audience. Former Democratic Congressman Alan Grayson of Florida joins us next. Congressman Grayson, thanks very much for being with us. It's nice to see you again. Thank you. Uh, you have uh, and have always had a knack for saying things in a way that connects with people. Sometimes you upset your critics, but you definitely always enthuse your supporters. Um, the Occupy Wall Street protests also seem to really be connecting with people, despite a real campaign on the right to portray them as scary. What, what do you think is, is resonating so much here? I think that they have their eyes open and more and more people are seeing the scales follow, fall from their eyes as well, because the Occupy Wall Street people are saying, first, that there's no accountability on Wall Street. They wrecked our economy. Years ago, they, they took a healthy economy and they gave us 9%, 10% or more unemployment. And they destroyed 20% of our national wealth in the course of just 18 months, from the middle of 2007 till the end of 2008. Destroyed 20% of our national wealth accumulated over the course of two centuries. And nobody's been prosecuted for it. Nobody's been indicted, nobody's been convicted. So first, there's no accountability. The second thing is that they've created a system that is enormously unequal. And the result of that is that people are struggling to find a job to pay their bills, to pay their rent, to pay their credit card bills. According to Wikipedia, there are only five countries in the entire planet that are more unequal than the United States in the distribution of our wealth. And that's a system that Wall Street created, that Wall Street maintains, and that Wall Street enforces. And the way that they enforce it is the third gripe. The third gripe is that Wall Street controls and dominates our political system. One party is a wholly owned subsidiary of Wall Street, and the other party caters to Wall Street all too much. 
So people have got into the situation right now where they feel that the system is completely unresponsive and they're driven deeper and deeper into debt and misery. With a movement with that kind of message, how do you think it ends up playing out and affecting American politics more broadly? Not even necessarily in strict electoral terms, but how does it change the framing of issues? I mean, the right is trying to denounce the existence of protests at all as, as, as mobs and social unrest. Glenn Beck today ranting about how people are going to be dragged from their homes and killed in the streets. Uh, the, the, the kinder, softer version of that on the right is to say that the protesters are motivated by class envy and class resentment dividing the nation. The right is reacting to this in slightly hysterical terms. That implies to me that people have actually got a message here that the right is worried about. Well, I think that Glenn Beck is right. It's only a matter of time before they do take him away, but not the way that he means, you know, in a straitjacket. I think is how they'll take him away. That much is, is obvious. But fundamentally, ask yourself, what people want is solutions to their problems, and what is either side offering in the next election? People don't see any solutions to their problems. You know, as, as I said earlier, there's uh, 24 million people in this country who can't find full-time work. There's 50 million people in this country who can't even see a doctor when they're sick. They want to know what's being done about this. What is going to help them in their ordinary, everyday lives? And they're desperate for solutions to those problems. The right certainly isn't offering any. You heard Herman Cain. His answer is, get a job. Well, it's not that easy. You know, if one person's out of work, maybe that one person can find a job. But if 24 million people are out of work, that's just not possible. The economy has been grossly mismanaged by Wall Street and by others. And people see that Wall Street is running our economic policy, that big oil is determining our energy policy, and that the military industrial complex is determining our foreign policy and miring us in these endless costly wars. And people are just fed up. So what do they do? What's left to do? What is the one thing that you can still do as a human being? You can go someplace. You can go someplace and in this world of the internet you can show yourself. And that's what the people on Occupy Wall Street are doing. They're doing the one last human thing left. They're going somewhere showing yourself and also finding each other, I think. Congressman Alan That's Grayson, right. uh, thank you so much for being here tonight and talking with us about it. I miss talking to you, sir. We'd like to have you back soon, if you don't mind. It would be a pleasure, Rachel. Thank Great. you. Thanks.